Where did you guys actually officially meet? What was the first inner encounter between the two of you guys? The first time we met, uh, well, Mike and I, the first time we met was outside of his house uh, on a snowy day, uh, which uh, then becomes the first scene of the film. Um, so it's it, Mike's uh, kindly out shoveling his snow when, when we arrive, and uh, we just started rolling because you never know what might happen that first moment. And <laughs> sometimes you don't want to do that if, uh, if you think it might be uh, confrontational, but uh, Mike was very welcoming, and um, his, he and his dog Tuesday were out there uh, bringing us, you know, clearing the sidewalk so we could come into his house. That was it, December of uh, five years ago. Yeah, 2013. Michael, why'd you let these crazy guys into your life? <laughs> Old people, just as they age, get less and less responsible. <laughs> and I don't know. Uh, they seem nice, and my dog liked them. And so, you know, I had to go ahead with it. <laughs> I'm kind of curious, since, since you named your dog Tuesday, did you find when they came up, were you going to try and name these guys after the day they showed up? <laughs> and Snowstorm. Uh, <laughs> and didn't help scoop the walk. Yeah. Uh, no, they they were just they were nice to me from the beginning, and I had met some of them before. Andrew was the last one uh, that I had met, and um, they seemed interested, and and it's fun to tell the story. So, uh, and have somebody that pretends to be listening. So, what was the first thing you started collecting, either as a child or just as a as a later adult, what was the first thing you kind of caught a hold of? Um, I didn't, I wasn't very selective in collecting. Probably uh, I just saved old things and family things and anything that was connected with the family. And um, I've never really set out to collect all of something, but it's just more of, especially things that have stories. Uh, stories with the family or uh, things that I could use at school. Uh, I like to tell stories with with an object. Yeah, we get to see that. It was so wonderful to see that in the film. Um, I'm kind of curious, when, when you first got your first piece of Brit material, was it back when you were at the old, like your, your mom's farm, or was it the new farm? Like, how did that come across? Uh, the first materials I got from the Britain collection was the same week that we got married, and the farm where we have the gazebo that we put on the porch, that was my wife's place. And so that happened the same time I moved into that house. Wow. Um, and that was 37 years ago. When you guys decided that you were going to look at all the stuff and film him taking all that stuff out, Tell me what about that process, because that seemed, I mean, obviously that stuff had been in there decades, and, you know, I mean, what was that like for you guys? But also then, Michael, that must have been a very freeing, but also scary moment for you. Well, uh, I can't speak for Mike and how, how scary it was to have somebody watching him do this, but uh, for us it was really exciting because, uh, you know, we had gone down there in part because we were curious about this mystery, you know, it was this kind of unopened box of, of treasures. We we knew that there were films, but we didn't know what else. And, you know, as Mike told us that there were papers and other stuff, but we didn't really know all that was in there. Um, so, yeah, it was it was exciting. Um, you know, he we happened across this story at kind of the perfect time when there was attention being paid to it from the University of Iowa and from the Red Cedar Chamber group who was um, putting music to the films and all these people kind of took interest at the same time. So it was the perfect time to turn a camera on. And so we were just lucky enough to be there then when Mike was, you know, kind of taking stock of everything that was in the collection. And it's, uh, I think to date, the only time the collection has ever been kind of laid out as it is when you see it in the film. And so that was an opportunity to really see every little piece that was in that collection. And you get a sense that this is, this is a life. Uh, this is not just a, you know, a collection of films, which are beautiful and wonderful, but this is, this is somebody's life that they've, you know, it's all been saved and kind of boxed away for 80 years. And, and now we get to, to look through it again. Um, so yeah, that was, that was really exciting. And as Andrew said, it had never been all laid out before because we never had the space to do it. When I got the material, uh, I moved a lot of it to my classroom at school. And 
uh, my junior high students cleaned it. And so that was as close to ever having things laid out um, at one time, and, and everything wasn't there at that time. But um, So it, it was exciting to me. We're still finding things in the collection. Wow. And when we moved it to the Ainsworth Opera House to spread it out, that was the first time we had things that, you know, we could actually organize them. You know, everything wasn't categorized in the boxes. This was the first time we could kind of do that, put similar things together. How often had you played it or checked it out yourself? Um, I started doing the films uh, in my classroom, and I also uh, taught some graduate-level classes and, and showed some of the films in those. And then we started uh, 22 years ago a film festival in Ainsworth, Iowa, when we show Brenton films. So they've been shown pretty much from the very beginning, uh, not always to the public, but uh, I would show them to classes until 22 years ago we started every year having a film festival with Magic Lantern slides and films. Michael, I was, I was amazed at one end all the material, but then I was also amazed at the way you let these gentlemen into your life when we get to meet um, your mother. What made you open up to allowing them to follow you on all aspects of what you were doing? I, I, I don't know, um, <laughs> but <laughs> part of it was at the beginning, the film wasn't about me. It was about the Britons. And I was just a door into that. And I didn't realize that somewhere along the line they shut the door. And, but, um, no, I, I really, in a documentary, if something is filmed, it has, what, less than 1% chance of being in the film. So that's what I was thinking all this time. Well, this won't be in the film, and this won't be in the film, and, and some of it was. <laughs> Andrew, when did you, I mean, from the moment we see him, I think we immediately have a connection, but when did you guys realize there's much more than just the historical element to this film? Well, I think it was, for me, it was really that first day. I mean, when, when Mike brings us into his house and, and it's very clear that, that he's, he's willing to kind of share something that nobody else has really ever seen, um, that that was special. So we wanted to continue down that path. And, and, and I think it was primarily, as Mike said, you know, this was about, you know, unveiling the Britain collection and we wanted to dig deeper and we were going to do that together. And then just as we really found out, it, I think it was all of the other things that Mike was doing in his community that really got us more interested in, in just his life. Um, and uh, so it, it started with the Britons, but then it was, you know, the trips to the local elementary school and, and taking kids on bus trips. It was the programs that he was doing at his mother's retirement home. It was all these other things that he was doing, um, you know, seed sack displays and um, I don't know, it's just endless. And his trips, you know, to, to visit the Amish community and, um, you know, going to the, the local sales barn to, to buy some new chickens. I mean, these things, even though I live, you know, 30 miles from Mike's door, um, I live in a city. And, and so, you know, rural Iowa, uh, as we see it in the film, was that was an exploration as well. Um, so, so Mike's really our guide. He's really our guide um, to exploring the Britain collection. He's our guide to exploring his community. Um, and, and, and then he ties it all together. And he, and he really, he's really, uh, you know, all of that is, is to bring people closer together in his community. And, and so hopefully the audience feels that kind of pull as well. Michael, I'd love to know, what do you love about teaching young kids? Because I think what we get to see you do with these kids is pretty miraculous. You, you open their eyes to things that, I mean, even I think adults may be shocked at, but I think the kids, it changes their whole world, their whole perspective. I started teaching when I was in third grade. I went to a one-room country school, and when I got my work done, the teacher let me teach the little kids. And so I've been teaching uh, a long time, and I think probably I'd never advance much past seventh grade myself and so I taught that age of kids for 39 years and I kind of fit in with them I guess and have a similar warp mentality and 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 I always enjoyed working with junior high age kids because occasionally you could be with some of them when they discovered they were human and that's such a delight 
some people never do, but sometimes kids do in junior high, and that's fun. <laughs> as far as time with Michael, how much footage, but also how much time did you get to spend with Michael overall? Well, uh, as Mike said, we first filmed and first kind of met each other five years ago, and I think... I don't know if this is entirely true, but I bet I've seen Mike every week since that day um, for five years. Um, you know, I'm sure there were a few weeks we took off. Um, mostly just recently. Yeah, yeah, mostly recently. But um, yeah, it was. Uh, we were excited just to hang out with him and go on these little adventures down in Washington County and, and see what he would show us. Um, and so, you know, for three and a half years, I think we actually filmed with him. Um, and so that resulted in about 250 hours of film um, or footage that we had from then. And then, you know, for the last year and a half, we've been taking the film out on the road. Um, so it's it's been traveling, um, you know, down. This is our second time to Texas. Um, but we've, uh, Mike was just saying he's been on, what, 85 flights or something like that. And, uh and 100, this would be the 106th screening he's been at in person. So it's been a, it's been a fun and long uh, road of uh, bringing, you know, doing just what Frank Britton did 110 years ago and uh, entertaining people uh, on the road. Do you feel you'd be an honorary Britain because you've traveled as much as they have? Well, I, he obviously enjoyed it. That's what he spent his life doing. And, and I enjoy it. I've had so many people say, aren't you getting tired? <laughs> and if I am, I don't notice it. Uh, it's fun. Everything's an adventure. You know, I'm old, and the fact that I'm actually out doing things is, is real exciting to me. And it, it is, it's been wonderful. And probably the most special thing, besides working with the film guys, is um, I taught school for 39 years, and not every place, but most places I've had former students in the audience. Wow. And even in London and, and all over, I had former students in the audience. And, and that's kind of neat to have people that uh, we were at the University of Missouri recently, and there were eight people in the audience, and some of them I hadn't seen for 40 years. And, you know, that does an old person's heart good to have people that keep track of you for that long. And, and it, it's really, really been wonderful. What does it mean to have... And this is for both of you guys. Um, universities, especially University of Texas, for where we're at, embrace this, want to help, want to expand what Iowa already started. I mean, obviously, Texas, I think, is very important to the Britain story as a whole. But it's got to be comforting that so many other universities, so many other um, people are, have gotten involved and are part of the movie even. I mean, we, we know one that's right behind me. So that's got to be something unique for a documentary filmmaker that, there's so much more opening every year, every week almost, it feels like. Yeah, it's, well, it's, it's, it's gratifying, I think, to go out to universities and, and find, you know, young people and academics both that uh, are interested in, in this mm -hmm. subject. And I think, um, yeah, Mike can probably elaborate on this, but, you know, I think for a long time this stuff was kind of, um, I think people were skeptical about, you know, whether or not, this collection was really as great as it is um, just because kind of the same reason I was a little skeptical is like really George Melies films and Lumiere films and Edison films in a basement it, that, it really um, so I think uh, it's been really gratifying to see people now kind of drawn to this film and, and to become a part of it and some of that happened during the filmmaking process um, so to continue that as we release the film is really great and you know we've talked about it already a little bit but you know Mike's a natural teacher. He's an educator. Um, and as he says in the film, he loves to educate people when they, they don't think they're learning. And I think that's one great thing about the movies, right, is if they're entertaining, um, you know, you just get caught up in the film and it's, it's a fun journey to be a part of. And then lo and behold, 90 minutes later, you've learned a whole lot. Um, so I, I think, you know, universities are the perfect place for that sort of thing to happen. Um, and, and I hope that people have a better appreciation for early cinema now than they, than they did then. It's just wonderful to have people share what we've had and, and enjoy it. And I think what a lot of people see in the film is the sense of community, which unfortunately we don't always have that anymore. But a lot of people will, will say that reminds me of my grandparents or it reminds me of the, the family farm in Kansas or something. And 
what I looked at as an Iowa story is kind of a, a, a small town America story. And it's just great fun to have people identify with uh, the sense of community. I'd love to know when you get to show these and you break out that wonderful player and you put everything together, what that feeling is like for you. That's got to be, I don't know, I don't know how to explain it. You, you're, you're bringing back history, but you're also inviting us to, to witness. It must be something very personally special. It, it has been just really wonderful. And one of the things, the last couple of years when I've done the film festival, I've not used the projector. I've used digitized copies, and people are s upset with me. <laughs> we didn't think you would ever do this. And I said, well, I don't want to do it. I, I like to hear the projector sound, but by using the digitized copies, I can pick and group films together, which I can't when they're on a reel. So... Uh, no, it, it's been great fun to, especially cranking the projector. I, you know, I kind of feel like other people's hands that were on that crank are kind of special. I kind of think my favorite shot is the shot you guys capture of him cranking it. And just your eyes are just staring at the screen. But for us, it's like a whole nother world. We get to see exactly what you just talked about. That was the first time I had ever done that. Wow. Because the projector got in. <laughs> but two days before the show, we didn't have much time to do anything with that at all. So really, the main first time of actually showing very much of it was at that performance. Wow. And, and that's some of my favorites, too, uh, just looking down on the, the projector and things. Uh, no, we were kind of holding our breath there for a long time, several things. Uh, the Guinness people didn't tell us that they were going to come until a couple of days ahead. <laughs> and the the projector just got there, and we had to. Film. The films came; those were all separate shippings, and to put the projector together. And the handbook was great help because it would say, you know, run the film through Sprocket forty three on the way to Sprocket sixty two, and and all of this is <laughs> very complicated. But uh, Andrew threaded it the first maybe every time it's been threaded i don't know but it, it's not easy but um it, it's and it's quite demanding to actually use the projector it doesn't turn easily and you have to have keep the fire door pulled so that if the film catches on fire you can drop that and it keeps the rest of the film from burning and in the handbook it says that uh if you have a fire drop the the little fire shield and wait for the smoke to clear and then continue with your program. <laughs> Andrew, what's it like diving back in touching it yourself, dealing with that, knowing you know everything about cameras, but also you know what the projection of it is going to be in a theatrical sense for this, but getting to do it that level, that must be exciting as well. Yeah, it was fun to be. Um, I, I was a part of the the show, the the big show there at Washington in a way that uh, that I hadn't been at any of other Mike's other shows. Um, so it was fun to kind of help plan that and bring all those people together and make sure that it it kind of went off, uh, you know, the night of, um, and then set back and and watch it because um, that was that was fun. Uh, I got to play with the cam or you know the the projector and help set it up and then and then when it was time for the actual show I got to just watch so uh it was fun but it's it's great to uh you know I grew up um in an era when film was still uh you know the only medium that you'd watch a film on and um and now when I work with young folks and and they've never seen a film before um it's fun to to show that to them and even for me you know we don't get that many opportunities um to to work with real film and uh, so, yeah, it's it's special. Is there a, a piece of the collection or pieces that mean the most to you? Or I mean, I know in the movie we get to see when when we first see the color and the, the, the painting, I was that was pretty special. But for you personally or, or both of you guys, is there uh, pieces that that mean the most to you for whatever reason? Uh, I know it's hard to pick. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, I like the photographs. I like the personal correspondence. There's much personal correspondence. Um, and I, I, people have asked me about, you know, how great the films are and such. And that isn't what drew me to the collection. And I don't know that it's the favorite part of the collection for me. I enjoy it immensely, but I kind of would like to fly. 
<laughs> and and he was doing that. And I think, you know, and he was almost flying in 1890 and the Wright brothers were still in junior high. You know, that that's kind of cool. And we're having models made of his airships now. And we've had engineers say there's no reason why they wouldn't have flown. That he had a totally different idea of of lift than what we do today. And, you know, that that's exciting. And, you know, everybody thought he was crazy, and I'm used to that. And so, uh, you know, in some ways I can identify with that. But favorite parts of the collection is, well, my favorite, my favorite thing is at the University of Iowa is keeping it all together. Mm. And, and that, you know, that enhances the collection. So, um, I, You know, I would say, for me, as a, as a documentary filmmaker, um, it's amazing to watch these early, early films of people kind of uh, exploring the real world, um, these early actualities and documentaries. Um, because I, I just love the, the sense of curiosity, and I feel like you can still, you can still feel like a tangible curiosity um, when you watch these films. You can sense the, the filmmakers because they'll, they'll pan over a scene or, or the way they direct the camera or what they've chosen to frame. Um, to me, I can still feel um, kind of their presence and, and, and their, their curiosity and their thirst to, to, to share this with someone else. Um, and that's kind of what we do every, I mean, that's, that's what making films is about, really, is, is sharing stories with people. So to me, that's kind of what I am drawn to, um, that I can still feel, feel that life even in these 110-year-old films. It's, it's fun for me to... I've watched now Saving Britain a few times, and each time I gather something a little different. Um, this most recent time, I gathered the the depth of the films that we get to see. I love um, the the 3D element that the films, when you project them, people are amazed at how much more depth there is to what they're seeing visually. There's not just something flat on a screen. It's kind of like our shot with the elevator. I kind of feel it's almost the same, like people are in the background. You see that in those early Britain films. They were the first ones to to capture that element of depth. Um, when you get to show it to people who haven't seen it for the first time, what do you guys notice that other people notice for the first time? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um. Well, I think for for a lot of people, the the movies are new. You know, they're 110 years old, but they're new. Um, people haven't seen films like this before um, because they've, you know, they're so far in the past that for many years they've just been completely forgotten. Um, so I think that was a big part of, of making this film and, and getting it out there is to share that with people. Um, but I think hopefully people have also uh, kind of a different appreciation, um, a sense for kind of the the lifestyle um, of the community where Mike lives. Um, we wanted to portray Iowa and the rural Midwest in a different light than I think oftentimes is shown. Um, and so, uh, you know, I also, I hope people can kind of appreciate um, the way Mike goes through life and his, his patience and his, his curiosity just with his local community, um, that there's so much magnificent, uh, so many magnificent things just so close to him in a place that most people wouldn't expect it. So I think, I hope people look at Iowa a little bit differently um, when they first watch the film. And something I think with the very early films, most people thought Charlie Chaplin and Laurel and Hardy were earliest films. And these films involve the audience more. The audience has to work more to watch these films because Laurel and Hardy and Charlie Chaplin a lot of times had subtitles. So that released you from having the responsibility of making the story. But the very early films, you need to watch carefully. You need to watch every facial expression to know what's going on. And we're not used to doing that in a film. And I think that part of the fun has been kind of helping people understand that early films, you have more responsibility in watching that film. And, and also the part that music played in the early films. And I don't know, it's, it's, it's almost a different medium. And the, the films that are color, sometimes one, one character in the film is colored and no one else is. Well, that's for dramatic effect. 
you now, when we watch a film, everything's color. So color is no longer a real factor in the film like it used to be. And it's fun to watch the development of the different aspects of film, but in the process of that, we've lost some things too. Mm. Uh, some of the, the drama and such that now we just go over and wait for the next car to crash. Uh, but in some of those early films, it was important that you, you watched every little detail and listened to the music and the narration because early films usually had narration also. So, What have you done with the space that was freed by getting all this out of your house? <laughs> um, please never ask that when my wife is <laughs> present. Uh, she um, collects as much as I do, although she doesn't realize that uh no that space is not just vacant space um it, it's it's pretty well filled um we've been able to shift some things around and maybe have access to things better but uh there isn't a vacant room in our house <laughs> is that plant still there yes we still have the plant wow and it's also an american gothic it's right here on the porch of american gothic is that same plant how did you find the original? What's the story behind that? Uh, I taught school for a long time, and a friend and I did teacher workshops. And we were doing them in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, which was where Grant Wood did much of his work and where his studio was, and where he painted American Gothic. And I knew that the plant had existed and was given to a lady that he had designed a house for. Well, Mrs. Armstrong, I knew, was no longer living, and I wondered where the plant was, and the man who got us to do the workshops in Cedar Rapids had been a friend of Grant Wood's sister. And I said, do you by chance know what happened to that plant? And he said, uh, yes. And I said, well, I, I'm interested in that plant. And he says, well, if you repot it, you can have some, because he had it. So it had just gone from Grant to Mrs. Armstrong to him. So I have a very direct route for the plant. And other people have starts of the plant too, and I give people starts occasionally, but it is the original plant. Wow. That's so crazy. I love the students are behind us. I think that's kind of <laughs> fitting, if you will. Um, as far as getting to shoot him talking to the, the students and like the, the vacuum cleaner, um, the wooden leg thing was, mm -hmm. I almost cried during that moment. Mm -hmm. what, is, what is moments like that capturing those moments in him, in his element? I think that's Michael at, at his best. Well, I think you see, I mean, you see the smiles on the kids' faces and you see the smile on Mike's face and you know that, uh, that everybody's happy to be there, which I think is not always the case in our modern <laughs> education system. So uh, I think Mike's doing something right that, uh, that I hope other, uh, you know, I, th I think plenty of educators do that as well. But um, that's, I think, when so much learning happens, when people are really having fun. Um, so I always admired that. Uh, I always thought that was a, a great thing um, to see Mike do. And, uh, yeah, I think, you know, a lot of what, what, you know, Mike mentioned this earlier, but a lot of what Mike s collects or what he saves are stories. Um, and the stories that he saves, he saves through these objects. And I think it's such a great way to engage kids um, and really audiences of all ages in, in learning um, is through these objects because when you can see it firsthand, all of a sudden you're transported um, to a different place, to a different time, um, and this story suddenly resonates in a different way. And so I think um, being able to save these things for, you know, kind of on behalf of his entire community that's that's a big part of uh, it's, it's a tremendous gift that he's given that community. So uh, it's just fun to watch. Yeah. And I think we have always underestimated children. Uh, when I would be teaching about Grant Wood, they would have an original Grant Wood in their hands. Well, when do you ever teach respect for something like that if you don't start then? And so kids always got to handle things and do things. And I always think that history is something you do. It's not something that you talk about. You should be doing it. So if we talked about log houses, we brought logs and we hewed logs. And, you know, and I don't know, doing things, you don't realize you're learning so much and it, and it works. So what can 
you tell us about what you're going to showcase tonight and what um, what what you're going to be able to show uh, us, uh, not just us, but the Austinites that get to sure. experience tonight. We're going to do something a little bit differently than how we've ever done it before, but we will be showing uh, starting the evening with Magic Lantern slides. And we'll be showing them on an unrestored Magic Lantern. And we've only done this a few times. And we'll be showing Magic Lantern slides that go back to pre-Civil War times. Uh, we'll just be showing a few slides. Uh, but that kind of will introduce the old films because this was what the Britons did before the films. And then at the end, I think if we have time, we'll show some of the original Britain films with narration and then we'll take questions and answers. Is there a, has there ever been a question that just stuck with you about being asked from either a young person watching this or just something that stuck with you in a moment that someone got to watch one of your experiences? Did anything stuck out either when you were in Iowa, Texas, London, France, wherever? Um, we've had wonderful questions and what I, <clears throat> what I like is that if we have a group of fifth graders or if we have a group of adults, the questions aren't different. Mm. And I think that's neat. Uh, when we showed in Houston um, a year ago this coming November, we had a bunch of fifth graders in the audience and we had to stop the show so that they could have lunch. And you know, that, that was good. We, we liked that. Um, there have been some marvelous questions and one of them, um, and I, I use this one a lot, but uh, when the film premiered in Washington, D.C. a year ago in June, I didn't think anybody would come because in Washington, <laughs> D.C. they don't know where Iowa is. And we sold out both shows in Washington, D.C. And then we had questions, and um, a lady, a, a very nice lady, raised her hand and said, and this happened in Iowa? And we said... You know, we didn't get that question in Iowa. <laughs> and, and that's one of the things I think the film does is it, it puts um, an entertainment emphasis on the mid, middle part of the country. New York and California claim a lot now, but historically it happened here before it really happened there. And I just think the reason for that is that the middle part of the country are better audiences. And if you have a good audience, you get good entertainment. <laughs> Andrew, do you have any experiences in showing the film that stick with you? Um, well, I, I, you know, kind of always uh, look back at that screening for these 150 uh, kids that we did in Houston as one of my favorite screenings that we had, just because it was it was a diverse group of from fifth graders to university students and everything in between. And yeah, we had to. We had to, to end the show because they still wanted to ask questions, but meanwhile, their, their lunch, they were running out of time to eat lunch before they had to go back to school, so <laughs> um, we had to send them on their way, but they were still so eager to talk about these things, and I just, uh, I never knew what, it, you know, heading into that screening, we'd never uh, screened exclusively for a group of kids before, and so I wasn't sure, you know, would they be trying to pull their smartphones out during the middle of the film, or would they be completely bored by this thing, or, you know, what would they think of it? Um, and they were just, they were so engaged, um, especially Mike brought his Magic Lantern slides then, too, and again, just to show them um, these things that they maybe had never even heard of, um, and they certainly had never seen before, um, the, the Lantern slides, the movies, uh, that was just really cool. And we've, we've shown it in a number of countries, and again, I thought, you know, Netherlands, are people going to come? And we sold out in the Netherlands, and um, we've been invited to what well, we showed in South Korea, and we've been invited to go with the film professors there to go through the film collection in North Korea. That hasn't <laughs> happened yet, but it was kind of an honor to be asked. And so things that we don't expect that, that happen just make everything real special since you guys are in so much communication um is there any filming going on now or you can you share anything about that i mean you've spent so many years with michael 
Yeah, no, we haven't uh, we haven't turned a camera on for a long time. Um, more sitting in front of a camera these days, which <laughs> is is fun. I guess it's the same for you, Mike. But <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, we're uh, the the filmmaking team. We're still interested in telling stories from the Midwest, so we're looking for what might be the next story. Um, but I think, you know, we're also excited for the next phase of this film, which is, you know, we're almost at the very, very end of at least the, the concentrated screenings around the country and traveling with the film. I'm sure we'll keep doing it. I think Mike booked us for something in 2020, just 20, a few 20. weeks ago. Um, so we know we'll at least have one a few years from now, but you know, I think we'll still go out with the film um, because it's always fun to appear in person. Um, but we're excited that the film will be, you know, released on DVD and Blu-ray and VOD, um, and then also have a public television broadcast premiere on January 1st. Uh, so all of that means that uh, finally anyone can see this film, and um, you know, hopefully. Uh, there have been enough people that are that are eager to see it that haven't been able to catch a screening, and um, we just hope that it continues to spread and people get to know to know Mike and get to know Iowa and get to know early uh, early film. The film played in I had over 100 shows in Iowa this last weekend, and so that's kind of exciting to to have that much coverage, and it is still uh, eligible to be considered for an Academy Award nomination. Should be. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks. Uh, um, maybe this is for Michael. The title of the movie is Saving Britain. Do you ever feel that you'll reach a moment where you feel that you've saved the legacy, or do you feel you'll always want to at least go out there and do this? Um, never had that question before. Um, I think we keep discovering more things to save, and uh, hopefully we can um, collect more stories and, and get them in print, because so much of the story works better in print than on film, uh, and so hopefully we can keep saving until I can't do that anymore. But um, And a lot of people have come up after showings and said, thank you that helps justify what i do and i two ladies in oregon came, waded through a lot of people and they came up and said thank you we can go home now and not feel guilty about not cleaning closets <laughs> and but what that does is that it allows people to see that maybe what they've been saving has value and maybe not right away but um you know that that's part of the fun of it and I think the success that the film guys put together a good story speaking of those film guys um, the beauty in getting to end the movie with um, planting a tree that's obviously very personal to Michael um, but I think kind of gets at the heart of the whole subject of planting something and seeing it grow and continue to grow um, what was it like being able to capture that moment well, yeah, I think, um, you know, that, that final scene, uh, well, I guess not quite the final scene, but nearly uh, of Michael planting that peach tree kind of in, in honor of his mother and, and honoring her, the legacy of his, his family over many, many years. That, that's definitely what this film is about, that, that you have to continue to cultivate um, kind of a, a knowledge of history, a respect for history. You have to cultivate community, um, all of these things. They don't, they don't survive without somebody there to, to pay attention to them. Um, so hopefully that's what people take away from the film is that, that these things will be lost, um, that they will be forgotten if, if someone's not there um, to, to hold on to them and save them for someone else. So uh, yeah, it was, it, was, it was beautiful to watch and I, I also have a peach tree in my yard um, that, that Mike gave me. Um, so uh, hopefully there's, there's more and more peach trees uh, growing all around uh, after this film. And after the film was over, uh, our son has moved on to that farm. So he's now the fifth generation on the home farm. <laughs>